Good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Clark. I'm with the History Department um, here at UNO. And I want to welcome you here today to hear another in a series of speakers that we've had since the fall of uh, 2018, when we had our first round table. Um, all of them talking about Iran, uh, different aspects of Iran and Iranian history. And uh, today we're going to have Dr. Shirvin Malikzadeh um, giving a presentation entitled The Revolution Will Be a Remix. Um, I also wanted to recognize our sponsors who make the, all of these visits by these um, very respected speakers possible. Um, first of all, the American Institute of Iranian Studies, and then the history department here at UNO, and also the Center for Afghanistan Studies. Um, to say a little bit about Dr. Malik Zadeh, um, currently he's a visiting scholar in Middle East Studies at Colgate University in Hamilton, New York, where um, he's completing a book manuscript on post-revolutionary schooling in Iran, which uh, reflects his current interest in education. He has a second manuscript that is currently under review at Stanford University Press, as well as a collection of dispatches from Iran um, entitled Fire Beneath the Ash, the Green Movement and the Struggle for Democracy in Iran, 2009 to 2021. Prior to going to Colgate, he served as a visiting professor in comparative politics at Williams College and at Swarthmore College. He received his PhD and master's degree in government from Georgetown University. And he has a BA in international relations from Stanford. Um, he also has um, a very impressive CV. He has written, published commentaries on democracy and popular culture in Iran and, uh, and about the US by him that have appeared in such publications as the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Foreign Affairs, and he's also appeared on CNN, France 24, and NPR, among other media outlets. Um, on his CV, the list of his publications, articles especially, and articles for the media, and also on live media, are impressive. But there were three or four that stood out to me with special interest to me. I don't know if they'll be interesting to you. One of these is he calls himself, and if you remember in 2009, there was a, a protest that occurred that were given the general name of the, the Green Movement. Um, and he refers to himself as having been an accidental participant in the 2009 protest, which is an interesting way to put it. It, it, it picked my interest. But he also has another article um, that caught my eye that is entitled Paranoia and Perspective, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Stop loving, uh, Start Loving Research in the Islamic Republic of Iran. This reminded me of strange love, the wording of it for some reason. Um, then he had another article that is entitled How the First Generation of Iran's Revolutionary Guard Became Its Most Important Source of Reform, which is very interesting in which prior to this talk, he was talking to my class in Modern Iran and we actually talked about that a bit. Um, and then, he had another one that was entitled, As Iranians Head to the Poles, a look at Hashemi Rafsanjani and how he helped build democracy in Iran, which is an, in, bring out an interesting question about this very important political um, individual who is, died a few years ago, but how important he was in his association with democracy. And finally, the the... The article title that caught my interest was one that uh, had this title, Iranians must take responsibility for their role in the 1953 coup. I did not pick that headline. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it, but, it, it, but, but it is a very interesting. No, but I but it is very interesting. I think there's a, a very good discussion behind that. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, it's a distinct pleasure for me to um, introduce Dr. Malik Zadeh as our guest here at UNO. Um, and uh, a very respected scholar uh, that uh, is coming today to talk with us. And he's going to talk today about another very important, uh, more current um, event that has been occur occurring in Iran, which is the protest that began last September in 2022 and went through the rest of that year and have currently died down somewhat. So it should be a very interesting talk. So join me. Um, I really appreciate that you highlighted some of my favorite articles, minus that headline. Um, the bit about the accidental participant in the green movement, that's a nice way of saying I was a coward. Because you go out with the folks who are protesting, people usually younger than me, and I'm in the back, you know, taking notes. And then the tear gas comes and everybody runs. And then suddenly I'm in the front, front line because everybody's smart enough to run away. So um, yeah, the plan was to go back and vote and maybe get some more notes, delay the writing of the dissertation. Little that I know that would be the biggest revolt since what we're seeing now in Iran. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for being here, folks on Zoom. I know a lot of family and friends are, are watching. Um, I'm going to read off this because I want to get the names right. Um, thank you to the American Institute of American Studies, the UNO History Department, the UNO Center for Afghanistan Studies, which I had the privilege of visiting earlier today. And above all, Professor James Clark. You know, I, I have to say, I've been invited to several places. I've been blessed enough to have been asked to give talks. And um, I've rarely encountered, if ever, the kind of hospitality I've encountered here. So I have to thank you, Dr. Clark, for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, hearing all your amazing stories has been really a blessing. So I have another day with you, too. So <laughs> um, it's one of the funny things working on Iran, um, on post-revolutionary Iran is that you don't know if tomorrow there will be a post-revolutionary Iran or something else. Um, there's a real sort of Sovietologist writing his dissertation in the 1990s, like late 80s, early 90s, five to Iran. Tomorrow this could all end, right? Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is a kind of historical take on events that frankly are racing ahead of us in ways that maybe we can't understand yet. Um, it's uncertain where this will all end up um, the contradiction, of course, is that the IRI, the Islamic Republic, finds ways to survive nonetheless. But there's always this feeling that it's all just going to end uh, very quickly. Um, I come to you here today just a little bit about myself as a displaced Midwesterner from a line of Iranians who became Americans, not in New York City or Los Angeles, uh, where so many end up, but in places like Peoria or Davenport and Des Moines. Uh, we were a cohort of immigrants who began our lives as Americans in the heart of America. This is a picture from Noruz with my mom and dad uh, and my little curly hair there. Our, our group in Peoria was a, an eclectic congregation of Baha'i, Jewish, Armenian, Shiite, Iranians who had found each other in the U.S. in the early, mid-1970s. Um, I had very little to do with this because I was 10 months old when we came over. So, um, But we came before the arrival of the flood. You know, the Iranians who left Iran, not because they chose to, but because they had to after the revolution. My dad having a good time with all his friends. Um, the United States brought our cohort of pro-revolutionary, pre-revolutionary immigrants together in ways that are hard to imagine happening back home. We had laborers who worked, as my father did, on the Caterpillar uh, factory floor, assembly floor, mixing with doctors and engineers, young college students and PhD students from Bradley University, which is the liberal arts school there in Peoria. Homemakers chatted politics with engineers. America made it possible for us to be Iranians in ways that were impossible back home. The revolution brought those days to an end. The group disbanded by the same divisions engendered by the change of political regime. In fact, sadly, we're seeing very similar effects happening now with the current protests in Iran in the diaspora. One, we, a picture from there at the middle, a uh, picture was taken in late summer of 78, just as the revolution was starting to go into the year. So, so bottom line is I'm thrilled to be here as an American to talk about Iran as a, as a displaced Midwesterner. Um, and I'm really very appreciative that you've, uh, you have me here. So I'll go ahead and get on to, uh, that's enough of the Oprah confessional, we'll get on to the lecture. It's been nine weeks since a young woman named Masa Amini was arrested coming out of a Tehran metro stop by the morality police, the Gashtar Shah. 
A tourist to the capital, she was there to visit family. Amini would slip into a coma shortly after her arrest on September 13th. Her death a few days later sparked the largest crisis for the Islamic Republic since the 2009 Green Movement. Some 326 people have been killed so far, including 43 children. In Tehran alone, authorities detained more than 1,500 people. Today, there's a lull in the protest, a, a tenuous kind of impasse that in Persian we might describe, describe as, this is the title of the book I'm hoping to write, Akashtir of study Fire Up Beneath the Ash. The flames could erupt at any moment. But the question I have for you guys today is why now? Why this revolt? After all, there's no shortage of atrocities and victims in the Islamic Republic. What makes these protests different? It's a question that I've been thinking about nonstop since this all began last fall. Are these protests revolutionary? Iran, of course, has been here before. We felt that we were living through a revolution in the late spring of 2009 when some 39 people, some 39 million Iranians, some 85% of the voting age population turned up to vote out an incumbent only to see their vote stolen, taken away from them. I was a direct witness for all of this. Uh, the vote was on June 12th. By June 13th, there were already protests happening all over Iran. And on June 15th, we had this, what I call the 3 million man march, Musavi march. 3 million people marching through Tehran. These are pictures that I took of that day. I don't know if you've been in a crowd that size, but you really understand, you know, Carl Sagan's blue dot, right? We're insignificant in the universe of things. <laughs> it's just, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a kind of transcendent experience. June 15th, unfortunately, also saw the killing, the murder of Neda al Sultan by security forces, a 26-year-old, perhaps a demonstrator, perhaps just a part, uh, someone who happened to be passing through where a demonstration was occurring. And her tragic death, much, much like Masa, Masa Amini, uh, last year became the emblem of the movement. Then as now, women were at the forefront of the face of the ongoing countrywide protests, which lasted nearly a year, led by a very simple demand. Rai Mankujas, where is my vote? Four years later, the voting public sees the answer with, with the shocking victory of Hassan Rouhani in the first round of the presidential election. That year, 73% showed up. Now think about that, right? He had 85% show up to vote, not obligated to vote in 2009. Four years after a stolen election, 73% show up to vote, which by US standards is incredible, an unthinkable amount of uh, people showing up at the ballot box. They elected Rouhani not because they believed in Islamic Republic, or even its ability to reform itself, but as an act of defiance, as retribution for what had happened four years earlier. And again, and uh, I had the blessing, the privilege of being there in the streets. You don't get to dance in the streets of Tehran, okay? And it was just amazing. It was an amazing evening. Kayvon Harris, who was here previously, was there with me. And, um, it felt like a revolution had just taken place, a jubilation that lasted into the night. What stands out across all of these moments and movements is the remarkable continuity of protest. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Young demonstrators gather in the same locations that their parents did, once did in 1979, in 1999, and 2009. Joining hands in Freedom Square and on Revolution Boulevard, place names where form follows function. The grammar of their revolt, the current generation's revolt comes from the Nizam or system itself, and did many of today's protest slogans riff on the native rhetoric of the Islamic Republic of Iran? Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, we are united. You hear that this year, last year, I heard this in 2009, from Zahedan to Tehran, I sat with my, myself for Iran. Marbar dictator, right? This is something that was said <laughs> against the Shah, it's being said now against the current leader of Iran. <laughs> the principal in the back telling those young schoolgirls to cut it out. But Cole and I were joking. We had adjusted the volume on that machine, but not this one. Anyways, I woke you up if you were falling asleep already. Uh, apologize for that. So Zanz and the Azadi, Women, Life, Freedom. To my ears, that's a riff on the most, probably one of the most famous slogans from the 1979 revolution. Love, Azadi, Jumhuri, Islam. The rhyme is there, right? But it's being remixed for a new generation of protesters. So the result, for now at least, uh, things have lulled down, uh, quieted down. It's been a kind of unofficial lifting of the veil in the major cities. Women without the job, once an extraordinary act, a very defiant, if not extremely risky act, act has apparently become, I haven't been back in Iran uh, in a few years, so I, I haven't seen this firsthand, but reports are that it's happening as a matter of daily occurrence. 
kind of extraordinary ordinariness. But the question again is at what cost? What is the, going to be the lasting benefit of the many killed, detained, imprisoned, injured by these protests? Already there's a word that you know, the authorities are trying to crack back down, if not directly, then through surveillance method, a kind of panoptic or panopticon kind of approach, recording uh, those who are defying the dress code. So to me, it remains an open question. This is what I hope to have as a conversation, rather than just be a lecture. I'm, I'm hoping to turn this into a discussion. You know, are these protests revolutionary? Perhaps it's better to ask, when does a revolution end? How does a revolution end? See, the one thing you have to understand about Iran, about living there, is that the revolution never ends. It's an ongoing affair, officially. It's never a finished event. So here's Khomeini coming back from France, from exile, very famous picture of him coming down to Air Force, Air France uh, steps in the first service to him down on February 1st. By February 11th, uh, it was all over. It took 10 days, the revolution was over. And they replicate this every year. Every, every February for 10 days, they basically reproduce the... The, the state reproduces the overthrow of the Shah and the process that went into it with festivals, parades, you know, gatherings, and all culminates on February 11th. But here you can see they brought a cardboard version of Khomeini and they uh, paraded that dude all over the street. This is classic, by the way, those of you who study authoritarian regimes, this is classic like authoritarian kitsch, you know. I mean, look how hokey that is. Um, yeah, yeah. Then they like took him to all the places that he'd been when he came back and they sat with him. They acted like he was real. Um, it led to a lot of memes, let me just put it that way, on the Iranian side of things. So for the Islamic Republic, the revolution is never an experience. It's a story to be retold, to be reenacted, particularly for the children, now the grandchildren of the revolution. These kids who have no memory of Khomeini, of the Shah of 79. So every official event is treated as a kind of education, right? There's purpose to this. Revolution comes but once. But re redemption requires a kind of faithful reprise of the moment of salvation, of grace, the day that the Shah left and the old regime was overthrown. But there's danger to this, right? To the public's exposure to the, to the grammar and habits, this is basically my thesis, the grammar and habits of revolt. As we'll soon see, the state organizes the schedule, but it cannot control the meaning that people attach to those days. Why are these guys out there? Why are those families out there to enjoy the celebration of revolution? Is it because they're pissed off at the Shah still? They're still mad at the Americans? Or is it because someone might show up in a Winnie the Pooh outfit and make your kids happy, right? Or you might see your neighbor and your friends. So, you know, there's a kind of formal process of reproducing the revolution and there's actually a lived experience. The origins of the aspirations of the Iranian people are not recent, but reach back over a century to Iran's first revolution, the constitutional movement, the love of master did. A revolution whose goals include an end to arbitrary rule through constitutional order and the removal of foreign elements, foreign powers from the borders of Iran. At the time, Great Britain, depicted here by the lion, and Russia, the Russian Empire, depicted here by the bear, and then the yeah. Persian cat there getting smushed. Um, leave that cat alone, right? <laughs> Revolution in Iran is not tied to one moment or one week in, in February 1979. The desire for personal dignity and the preservation of Iran's uh, sovereignty is much older and deeper than the Islamic Revolution. It stretches across the decades to the present. So one thing that I want you to take away from this lecture today is that continuity is inimical, is inherent to change in Iran. Continuity is the basis for change. Uh, put more bluntly, the language and demands of protests are inacceptable, inacceptable, inseparable from officialdom and from the past. Revolution, if it comes to Iran, will not be a rupture, it will be a remix. It won't be a rupture, it will be a remix of the past. We can see this in the slogans. Again, these are pictures I took in 2009. You know, the, the participants in the protests using religious discourse, official discourse against the state. You say that you're an Islamic regime. You say you stand for values. Well, part of being a Muslim or being a good person is being honest. Honesty equals Islam. The president at the time, Ahmadinejad, was uh, notorious for being a liar, shameless liar. Uh, I really like this one. Liars are the enemy of God, right? Duru, lie, with the, the cross through it. You know, they're not putting up signs from Montesquieu or from Jefferson or George W. Bush or whatever, right? They're putting the language of what they learned in school, what they see on television every day, they being the, pop, the public, and turning it against the state. Essentially, the instruments of domination and control being used as instruments of opposition. This is where I think the story gets really interesting in Iran. And it's not just slogans, right? 
activists appropriate have been appropriating the revolutionary calendar. They did certainly last December uh, with a work stoppage. There was a several day work stoppage, all centered on December 7th, 2022. To the Iranians in the room, do you know, do you remember what day this is? It's a tricky question and an unfair question because you've left it behind. So. Who's a Donish Jew? This is University Student Day. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to be reminded of myself when I work on education. So, you know, there was a mass strike in Iran in December. Uh, it was time to coincide with this holiday. This holiday comes about because then Vice President Nixon rolls into Iran uh, to, you know, show American charity largesse, I guess, after the coup, which had occurred in August of 53. This is December 7th, 53. He goes to Donish Club, Tehran, University of Tehran. There are protests there, as students are wont to do, and three uh, students, or three individual young people, end up being killed. And then after the revolution, they are honored through this day that's designated as their day, the Day of University Students, right? It's a day that the current regime, the Islamic Republic, treats as a major event in the revolutionary process. It's part of its pedigree leading up to 1979, and a way to honor, not to co-op, university students, which Frankly, they remain a little bit worried about or scared about in terms of their revolutionary potential. So what's interesting is that same holiday has now been appropriated by the protesters in Iran. You have this official day on the calendar. It's like, okay, it's the day of the university student. You guys are killing us. You're putting us in Evan prison, right? You're denying us our educational rights. We're going to make it a day of protest against the regime using the same standards and values that you profess you stand for. And what's really interesting for me, what's really fascinating for me, it's not just happening in Iran, but Iranians outside of Iran, Iranian students outside of Iran are taking the same holiday and using it as a, an occasion to protest. So this year, you have protests, I think it's UC San Diego, right? Uh, UVic, University of Victoria up in Canada, British Columbia uh, protested. And it's not just revolutionary holidays or even Islamic holidays that are being appropriated or the slogans, but also national holidays such as Nowruz which I don't know if you guys celebrated. I, it's my understanding there's an over celebration out here. Um, this is not just Iran, but across the Persian speaking world, you know, it's a very important holiday. It happens on March 21st. It lasts for 13 days. Um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Iran, Afghanistan, all celebrate the, the Persian New Year. Well, this year in Nowruz and Safez, if I'm saying that correctly, in Iranian Kurdistan, where Masa Amini hails from, her family, organize a protest on the occasion of Nowruz at her gravesite. Again, this is the young lady that sparked all of these protests in Iran. You see from this Twitter statement. Uh, and I have a video here of them at, the, at her grave. <laughs> So, you know, you can't get rid of Noruz, you can't get rid of the Students' Day. These things are there, fixed into the calendar, baked in, but they've become uh, uh, moments for opposition, a kind of weak spot uh, against the regime. So I think many people had high hopes that, you know, this, this revolt, this set of protests would be the set of protests, that this would all end the Islamic Republic. And, you know, for a lot of people like myself or longtime Iran watchers, maybe because I've already been through this, and I can only imagine those who are even older than I am who have seen the actual revolution, the 79 revolution, how they feel. There's a kind of, I don't want to call it cynicism, but like us so-called experts, as much as we're experts, had a kind of skepticism of where this would lead, right? I think our hopes were tempered. And so again, the conceit of this lecture is that change will come to Iran, but it will come in a way that won't be satisfying, I think. It's going to involve elements of the past or elements of the regime that remain there. Um, it's not going to be a dramatic and complete break that so many want. Again, there's a kind of shared grammar of opposition and rule between state and society and Iran. And so what I want to do for the rest of the lecture is kind of suggest to you or show to you why you can't appreciate what's happening presently in Iran without understanding the, lived, the recent lived experience or memory of Iran and understanding the sort of grammar that I'm describing. And I'm going to start with elections. I'm going to focus on the period of 2009 to 2019, which by my estimation was a sort of high point for democratic participation uh, in Iran. I think against the odds and against expectations, we might even say that Iran was becoming more democratic in spite of itself. 
not because the regime allowed it, but because the public demanded it and took what they wanted from the systems, from the instruments of voting that were available to them. Now, this all comes to a screeching halt in 2020 with the parliamentary elections in Iran and then 2021, where the state starts to see what's happening and they finally clamp down and don't allow uh, oppositional candidates and reform candidates or even moderate candidates to run for office. And it, ends, it culminates with the election of the current president, Ibrahim Raisi, in 2021. From there, I'm going to move on to education, to schooling, and the role of education inspiring, as well as dampening protests. And I'm going to give a very brief, I'm not a sociologist, but I'm going to try to give a kind of sociological, even cultural overview of Iran's Gen Z kids, the ages of you guys who are undergrads here. And this is the cohort of Iranians who were born between 1997 and 2010. They make about 6 million uh, of the country's 83 million population. So they're less than 7% of the population but they are definitely on the front lines and the first victims of the current repression and current protests. What all of this comes down to, guys, for me at least, is presence. What happens when citizens, ordinary Iranians, show up? And now that means whether it's at the ballot box or in the classroom or in the square to protest. How does the regime or the, uh, the Nizam respond to their presence, to their demands? Okay. So that's kind of the setup here, a very long-winded setup, perhaps. I'm going to pause here for a second and see if there are any questions. Is there anything I should clarify? Or... No? Press on? Okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to start with elections. Respect the hustle. Um, I got to, as I said, I think I suggested earlier, I, I was there for several votes, uh, starting with the 2009. I, I voted in the U.S. too. Here I am with my beloved grandmother. We had voted, she gets a little... Uh, ink spot on your hand. Uh, as a side note, and Cole's a grad student, and he's doing a good job because his hair, he has a good haircut. If you ever become a grad student, don't grow regrettable ponytailed hair. Like that. You're a guy. Um, anyway, I fixed it up. So by 2013, I had my hair set straight. So I was there for the 2013 elections, and then again in 2016. Um, so Again, you can see visually demonstrated like the turnout numbers in elections in Iran just put to me, to my mind, puts the U.S. to shame. Um, 73% in 2016. These are presidential elections. And then here are the legislative elections, much greater than the U.S. in general. Okay. Um, <coughs> so for Iran's reform movement, voting is a kind of non-negotiable imperative. And the reason is very simple, right? When you have huge turnout in Iran, above 60%, 70%, the more progressive elements tend to win, right? Because many Iranians either refuse to vote, they're not obligated to vote, or they completely hate the system. So if they're showing up to vote, they're not going to vote for hardcore conservative elements. They're going to vote for the more progressive elements who will put a stop to the, the wins of more conservative uh, candidates. But the question again is, that's from the perspective of mobilization or from the leadership of the progressives or the reformists in Iran. If you're just an ordinary everyday citizen, you're just trying to make it day to day, why would you bother showing up in what is clearly a rigged system, right? No one's forced in Iran, it's not a real democracy. Why would you bother? You have to stand in line sometimes for hours. Why would you come and participate um, in these elections, it's a, it's a perpetual dilemma until very recently whether to participate or whether to boycott elections. Now, from the perspective of the state, and this is the exact opposite of what we have here in the U.S., I'm telling you, you'll be watching TV, they'll show some random American movie, and in the corner there'll be like a countdown, a ballot box with the number of days left until the vote. Every day is a reminder, show up to vote, show up to vote. Why? Why does the Nizam, the system, want ordinary Iranians to vote? because it demonstrates legitimacy, right? It shows to the Americans, to the Europeans, to the rest of the world that we have a true democracy and people love our revolution. Look at them, they're standing in line to vote for hours. And so, you know, you see banners like this pop up all over you know, major set, urban settings. Every vote is a bullet to the heart of the enemy US, right? Your presence is the answer to sanctions. You get that fingerprint, right, when you vote. It's smushing Uncle Sam. So there's a kind of official discourse that voting is a kind of virtuous act. It's a holy act. And said so as much right here by Khomeini casting his ballot. It's a massive billboard, I think, in Meiduna and Bagal, Revolutionary Square. You know, voting is taught to children from a very first, from a very young age, from the very first days of the revolution. This is what I studied in the textbooks. And you have lessons on democracy, that voting means 
you're a good citizen, a good person. It's, it's this idea that the Islamic Republic was born through voting, through a referendum on the 12th of five ID, Islamic Republic Day in April of 1979. Um, and this, this slide in particular is very interesting to me. It's not a situation where Islam is being attached to democracy, but democracy actually comes out of Islam, right? I mean, this is a bunch of nonsense, right? This is re reimagining and rearticulating something that has different origins or has a different kind of provenance. But nonetheless, the claim here is that to be a true Muslim means to participate in democracy. Okay. And it's always contrasted to the US, which is seen as perpetually on the brink of collapse, right? The uh, Jahannami, a hellish by polarity. These are a little bit dated to Trump. You know, that whole scenario with Biden going into the, the most recent presidential election. Hope returns Iran. Biden is probably the fastest he's running like 10 years here on this picture here. And then, you know, you have these crazy memes of like, I don't know, you guys remember the Jeb meme, right? Um, riffing on that. So there's a lot of fun around American voting. This, this is more oppositional, I suppose. Um, but what I want you to consider this, the way I approach this is there's a scholar named Lisa Wadeen who writes about participating in the nonsense kind of parades or celebrations that authoritarian regimes demands of its citizens. You participate as if you believe this BS. I guess I'm on Zoom, so I have to censor myself a little bit, right? This is just a bunch of lies, and you know it, but you act as if it's real. I think in the Iranian case, we have a situation of what if, right? What if I show up? You have a purpose for me to vote, which is to give the middle finger to the US, which is to stick it to the Americans and to show it to the rest of the world that we believe in this revolution. Well, I'm gonna show up, but not for that reason. I'm gonna show up and call your bluff. I'm gonna vote for the guy you don't want to win, that you allowed to run for office. You screwed up and allowed him to get on the ballot or her to get on the ballot. What's gonna happen if I do that, right? I mean, you have this phenomenon in Iran, at least for a period of time, where there were these kind of miraculous outcomes, unexpected outcomes in a competitive authoritarian regime where the opposition actually won. There was no way around it. There was no way they could disguise it without leading the protests like happened in 2009. So again, we have this politics of presence, a kind of ruthless, my friend Kayvon Harris, who I referred to earlier, he refers to it as a kind of ruthless pragmatism, a politics of presence. And again, every time you have huge turnouts in Iran, you can see from this graph, the, the the more liberal candidate wins. 2009, despite it being stolen, right? 2013, 2017, look at 2021. What do you notice there? Huge decline, right? So if you don't get numbers out there, it's going to be the most retrograde or most conservative elements are going to win the election. Now, this is a dilemma for the state because they want to have huge turnout, but every time there's huge turnout, the more conservative candidate loses. Okay, so the opposition took advantage of this fact. They boycotted elections in 2005 after Nijia gets elected. There was a boycott of elections and the lesson was learned. So let's come back in 2009 and show up with huge numbers. And the mentality is from the opposition's point of view is that however much you remove yourself from the system, you're still inside the system, right? And the major slogan, at least in this period that I saw was prevention is better than a cure. You can't fix these clerics, right? But at least we can prevent them from sending their worst bastards into the corridors of power. So there was this like me, and it's curious to me because there's a bunch of hipster Iranians hanging out in a coffee shop debating whether or not to vote. This guy was very skeptical. Um, but his friend says, you know, she chastises them. You know, we don't need big change. We just need small changes. And so, you know, we show up, this is my cousin. These are my cousins. And myself, and we go and go, and it's just like a great kind of festive atmosphere. You show up to the mosque. We were watching a TV show that was really popular at the time. And anyways, the, the boat was really late for us, so like 11 a.m., 11 p.m. Check out this dude here. He rolled it for democracy on his uh, roller blades. It, it's just a, it was really kind of a, an amazing experience for us to have a, an election where you have an outcome that turns out a way that you didn't expect. But one thing I want to show you here in the last section here on elections is that voting also had a kind of salutary or a beneficial effect on those who were running for office. You had just in, in, um, in 2016, in Tehran alone, there are 30 uh, parliamentary seats, 1,021 people ran for office. And man, did they run. Like they just hustled their behinds off with all sorts of adverts, all sorts of promises. You know, this is the democratic process. This is what we expect. Everybody likes to make fun of politicians for lying or for being phony baloney. 
But in reality, elections force these candidates to placate or to serve the public. You know, you, you might have a dude like this guy who's like super cool, like he's coming out of the matrix, a capable, I found this advert on a, on a train, capable city with a successful engineer. And then on the back, you get your little bribe here if you vote for him, right? For the internet. Uh, just to kind of appeal to progressivism and modernism, but strangely enough, a kind of secular appeal. And if you look at this image of Ms. Batam Kaw running for office, what's your first impression? Just if you can't read Farsi, for example, what do you think of her? What she might stand for? Is she pious, not pious? What do you think? She's a conservative uh, representative. Yeah. Let's look, let's look for a little uh, advert on the back and see what she stands for. This is how she, she talks about how she has a PhD. She has a bachelor's and master's in law. She's worked in government before. She's very well qualified. In Iran, you have this phenomenon where the appeals, unlike the US, right, appeals to religiosity, to being holier than thou is, is off the table. You can't even run for office if you don't already demonstrate your commitment to Islam and to the revolution. So candidates have to distinguish themselves by their talents or the, by their experience. And what I've seen is a lot of emphasis on the kind of secular qualities. This guy, Mubadad, he's the voice of the people, right? Look at his face. Of course, he's the voice of people. You know, he has a he has a master's degree in engineering from one of the most important schools in Iran, universities in Iran. I mean, Tabir. He has a master's degree in public administration, and he's worked in the government before as a vice minister in the Ministry of Energy. This guy too, Sabz Vahi. He's an expert in industrial management, expert in public administration, expert in finance. But most importantly, guys, he has a very good headshot and a <laughs> ghostly face in the background, right? In fact. Chin game is very important to elections in Iran. <laughs> Look at this young guy with his chin. Uh, to me, this is a beautiful thing. This sort of hokey nonsense that politicians feel compelled to do. You have this guy doing jacket game, right? <laughs> oh, then you have me game, right? I'm coming to help you, my citizen. And my favorite, I call this the ethnic. He's doing that kind of, I mean, the Italians have this too, right? The sort of hand gesture, type of reading and everything, the stash. So, you know, this was, this is the kind of happy story, right? But there's also the unhappy story, which starts to happen with the violence of 2019. I'll talk about that in a minute. But in particular in 2020, where the, the systems puts the kibosh on uh, candidates who are seen as not being fundamentally in line with the most hardline elements. Um, the preventive for running in the 2020 parliamentary election, there were more than 7,000 candidates who were eliminated from participating in the 2020 vote, almost all of them reformists and moderates, including 60 members of the then Iranian parliament. So think about that. Incumbent parliamentarians were denied the chance to run again for office by the Guardian Council. They were disqualified for having quote unquote insufficient ideological loyalty. And so the turnout just went down the toilet. 43% across the country. In Tehran, the turnout was an abysmal 26%, right? By closing off peaceful avenues of dissent, the state ensured the return to violence. What had been a virtuous cycle of elections after the 2009 Green Movement for this 10 year period was replaced by a, from below by an emerging cycle of protests and violent counter demonstration, an accelerating path to ruin without the usual off ramp of elections to restore the peace. And that's what democracy does in Iran. With, in its limited version, it creates off ramps for peaceful conciliation of difference, and certainly for the conciliation of difference between elites. But when you don't have proper elections or that sort of escape valve, then the public turns, they either detach from politics or they go out in the streets and protest. Okay. So I'm gonna pause here for a second. Are there any questions or comments before I go on? I'm gonna go on to the Gen Z and the education part of the talk. So Cole, Dr. Clark, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. Great, okay, good, that's an uncommon. Yeah. Answer for me. It's a 140. Okay. No questions. I'm going to antagonize some of you with my comments. So if, if you feel like there's something you disagree with, I'm happy to have a. No. Okay. Okay. So let's look at the schooling of Islamic citizens. Uh, this is my cousin Sebi de Hashemi. Uh, her pre like uh, these kids must be high school or college right now. Uh, from 2009, 2010. Look how cute they are. <laughs> But this is what we think about when we think about education in Iran, isn't it? Get that young girl or AK, she's gonna go destroy Israel, she's gonna destroy America. Don't think about 
this beautiful girl right here with her, you know, mini mouse bow tie or whatever. My daughter's three. She loves the mini mouse. Um, again, this is the yes. Where is this picture from? Is it an original picture? Yeah, how did? So I was gonna make it. There you go. But honestly, I just found it on the internet, so I didn't even check yet. So from the time of Iran versus Iraq War. Uh huh. Yeah. This picture? Yeah, this picture. Absolutely, yeah. You can yeah. have the soldiers in the background. Yeah, very good eye. But again, my, my comment here, and I appreciate the Iranians in the room, ask this, if you're in America, I grew up here mostly, right? This is every day. There is, it's timeless, right? I think that's the stereotype. And I don't think I'm wrong when I say that. The haruz, right? <laughs> the end of time. This is what we get out of Iran. The foreign policy had an article, they did all these world's worst textbooks, they had all the usual suspects, North Korea, right? I think even Putin, you know, Putin's Russia, and Iran, of course, shows up on that list, right? That all these kids are doing, they're getting ready. They only show the little girl with the AK-47, getting ready to go, you know, commit martyrdom uh, in, in support of this cause, mindlessly doing this. Now, this is a contradiction, right? Because the impression is, even from the American or the foreign perspective, is that these kids are all being brainwashed until they turn what? 18 and go where? University, right? And then at that point, ah, they become a threat to the system. So from this cartoon, this came out the, during the 2009 protest. It says, saw the saw the So first year, second year of university, third year of university, fourth year of university. It's self-explanatory, isn't it? When the young lady goes to school and gets educated, she becomes less pious. She becomes anti Islam or anti-revolution. Dr. Clark mentioned the pictures of the girls, the young ladies with the cape on their nose. You see that here. She ha she's had a nose job by her fourth year. Um, so I, again, you know, there's a kind of contradiction of tension here between what does schooling actually achieve or accomplish? What are its effects on the young people? Uh, we know that the performance of women across all levels of schooling has been nothing less than amazing. In 1997, women comprised just 37% of university students. By 2005, they had surpassed their male counterparts at 51%. That number reaches 60% or above. And I mentioned this in the, in the class when we were with, with Dr. Clark uh, at the more elite universities, the more selective universities. Women regularly outperform their male counterparts in coveted public university spots. So I think one of the great contradictions of the Islamic Republic is that it treats its women as second-class citizens, but it has some of the most educated women in the world, right? And the reality is, though, for most families, for almost all families, I think, is that they don't send their kids to school for the ideology. Kids go to school for the same reasons that we go to school. And when I say school here, I mean university, right? What is that? Are you guys here for the, you know, rah-rah, USA, whatever? You don't even have that at a public university, right? Why do you go to university? For better uh, education. Which leads to a better uh, pa uh, Be honest. Career. <laughs> yeah. Career, more money, right? What else? Prestige. Prestige, which leads to what? Again, be honest. Better marriage. Thank you. Or marriage at all, right? So there's a marriage market, I mean, very cynical here, but there's a marriage market and a labor market which are serviced by going to university. The same is true here, the same is true as Iran, in Iran, and I suspect in most of the world, okay? So getting college degrees seen as in, being indispensable. So, you know, between 60 and 70% of people ages 18 and 24 are enrolled in some form of higher education. It's at 73% by this most recent stat that I found. Uh, but it peaked above, no, it peaked at 73%. In the US, it's like 80 or 90% enrollment at a university. This is, again, coverage of 18 to 24 year olds, how they measure it. So the assumption shared by regime supporters and critiques alike is that young Iranians, and especially women, when they get schooled, when they get educated, right, they become a kind of ticking time bomb that will blow this regime apart. The young women will not put up with it once they get the, the education. But the regime, the Nizam needs educated women, not only because it needs doctors, engineers, poets, whatever, it also needs to demonstrate to the world that this revolution serves modernity. This revolution serves the future in a way that the Americans cannot, that the former Soviet system cannot, right? That we have the best system because we're doing it the Islamic way. And so there's a kind of dilemma here, again, with, as with the voting, you see what the connections here, as with the education, what do you do? You need women to be educated, but you don't want them to become rebels against the system. 
And again, I just want to say that I think this is to emphasize this bit about uh, contradiction, you know, the idea that everybody is a putty to be molded until they turn a certain age, until they turn 18 is nonsense, right? I mean, I don't know. These are my kids, right? I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And I used to be a three-year-old, right? And I used to teach six-year-olds. I'm assuming many of you have been around children. Who's in charge when you're around children? You're Look at me. I mean, yeah, there's the teacher, there's the parent, but kids are in charge, right? A lot of the times where you have to negotiate constantly with them. I'm learning this very strongly lately as a parent, as a, you know, with young kids. There's just, there's not a scenario where kids are just passively taking in information. And certainly not a switch that's flipped once they go into university where they become rebels again with the cause, I guess, against the system. So again, I want to emphasize this ideology, I think, in Iran, and this is demonstrable through the participation rates and the purposes, reported purposes for going to schooling, is not, it's not about ideology, it's to get the grade, to get the degree, to get the job, right? It should sound very familiar. Ordinary Iranians have appropriated the educational system for themselves, transforming an ideological apparatus uh, designed to produce Islamic and loyal citizens into a transactional relationship between the pedagogical state and its population. Through sheer weight of numbers, through presence, ordinary Iranians have transformed the public resource, the school system, into a private good. But it's come at a cost, right? We talked about this in class, uh, Dr. Clark's class, uh, just an hour or so ago. By conceding the, basically the Nizam, the system has conceded the ideological character of the school system. State authorities have secured the participation and the cooperation of families and the withdrawal of children from oppositional activities. For most students, who are in school, just getting involved in politics or in politics is just not worth it. It's not worth the cost, especially if you don't know what's gonna come next. So it's better to just get the paper, get the job, get out, right? Against expectations, and at least for the past decade or so, I think we've seen a kind of uh, quiet campus across the country. Now this has changed dramatically in the last year, right? So my whole thesis here has been falsified. If you do social science, you have to be ready for this. I've been writing and talking about this for a long time. And then suddenly last year, you saw high school students and university students risking it all, going out there. And when I say all, I'm not just talking about a job. I'm talking about their entire lives, right? Going out into the street and protesting. And it all seems to be tied up into the mentalities, the worldviews, the characteristics of the current generation, the young generation of Iranians. And so when we say that means 80 in Persian. These are kids who were born in the 1380s, which would be the late 1990s, early aughts. Did I get the numbers right? Yeah, a little bit later. A little bit later? Okay. Not millennial. After the, after the 2000s. After the 2000s. Yeah. So 97 is too early. Yeah, 97 would be 70s. Okay. Yes, that's right. Okay, just a couple of years ago. Yeah. So I'm from, I was born in 74. I'm considered Daesh, Daesh, like. Yeah. Chaps, right. Not less level. Third generation. These guys are the 80s generation. So the American days are off a little bit. But basically, um, this is a kind of group of kids that, I mean, already in 2016, there was a sociologist uh, back in who wrote this, Gen Z will pass everyone. He wrote this in Persian. It's been translated. And you can see what he wrote. This is now seven years ago. That these guys are different. Somehow they're different. One thesis is they were raised by parents who are of my age, who grew up you know, in the student movement, who had seen the 2009 Green Movement. And so they are much more lenient or much more encouraging of these sort of oppositional activities of what are now their kids, the Gen Z kids in Iran. But honestly, we see that in the US too, don't we? We're just talking about the opposition to, you know, the gun laws, for example, in this country, or abortion rights in this country. It's really the youngest folks I think are turning up and turning out in uh, protest. I interviewed a young professional in 2018, and she expressed astonishment, not a little bit of fear about her younger peers. And you can see what she said up here. She's like, I would not mess with these kids. And you could already see in 2018 that this was a group of Iranians, young Iranians, who were not going to take anything uh, from the system, were ready to go out. And I have to tell you, this is maybe she's the right group, right? Uh, I took this picture in 2009. This is a hardened bunch, right? 90% were under 17 when the 2009 uh, Green Movement happened. And they saw firsthand the, the suppression of the crowd. And when they were kids, when they were children, they saw their older cousins, their siblings, their, their brothers, their aunts, their uncles, you know, 
getting snacks brought to them while they study for the concours for the university entrance exam. Um, and they were present at the graduations and they saw what happened. They get the degree, the relatives get the degree, and then they don't get a job. There isn't that promise that was given to them about getting educated and having a future didn't pan out. So to me personally, and this is my kind of anecdotal take on this, it's not surprising that this cohort of young Iranians are willing, is willing to, uh, unwilling to accept the present circumstances. They know that things are unlikely to get better with a college degree and no amount of education will end the corruption of feckless elites. And of course, the election, electoral path, the sort of peaceful path, as I said, have, has been denied them completely now. So it should come as no surprise that the slogans and spaces that constitute post-revolutionary Iran provide its youngest citizens with a ready arsenal to use against a state and regime that continues to repeat the mistakes of its predecessor, of the regime that the Islamic regime overthrew four decades ago. Here I'm tying it back to what I said at the very beginning of the structure. That you have this youngest cohort of Iranians. They know their mantras. They know their march by heart. It's a measure of the regime's pedagogical success. They've learned the grammar of the system. Right? They may not believe it, but they know what it said, what it's taught them, and what the consequences uh, of those that grammatical form of protest is. For the keepers of the Islamic Republic, revolution is a never-ending educational experience. Right? It's a righteous lesson to be reenacted in schools for the children and grandchildren. And so, what do the kids do? They insert new meaning into those protests, rep the existing repertoires of opposition. It becomes a kind of logical extension of the IRI central message to its youngest members throughout history. Where there is injustice, this is what you're taught from day one, right? We overthrew the Shah, we overthrew the monarchy because it was unjust, it was un-Islamic, okay? We think what, this is now a Gen Z person, we think what you're doing is unjust, right? Is anti-Islamic. So we're gonna do what you told us to do, we're gonna protest. Revolt as your parents and your grandparents did against the Shah. So the educators, the people educating these young youngins today, I think neglected to consider the possibility that every generation comes up with its own origin story. And for the, the young Iranians today, that origin story are, was the suppression, I didn't go into too much detail about this, in 2019. There were protests in the, the winter of 2019 around fuel price increases in Iran, and it got bloody very fast. Um, I'm gonna get the numbers right here. It was in over hundred cities, over 300 Iranians were killed, maybe as many as 1,500. It was basically a scale of violence and mayhem that we had not seen in Iran, in, perhaps ever since after the revolution. And this really left a lasting impact in the collective consciousness, particularly, I think, of young people. It, it, 2019 represents a kind of lived trauma, an absolute calamity of violence and death, one that young folks certainly will not forget, right? So this generation of Iranians, I think, refuses to be denied the democratic future promised more than 100 years ago by Iran's first revolution, the Constitutional Revolution, and which successive generations have struggled for over and over again, but been denied. If that means a turn to violence, so be it. So here, finally, I'm at the conclusion. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, so the question becomes, what next? If this Nezam or system is to end, what will replace it? And really, guys, the question to ask yourself is, how will it be replaced? You know, the, the reality remains in Iran, much like in the U.S., there are 30 percent, there's about 30 percent of the population that will support the current hardline elements, no matter what. But what are you going to do with them? You want to change the system, you want to overthrow the Islamic Republic, what are you going to do with this crowd right here? Right? They're not going to go quietly, and they probably won't go without violence. And frankly, they're supported by the instruments of official violence, by state security forces. On the other side of the ledger, you have a public particularly young public that has shown a willingness to go headlong. I describe it as like the Kool-Aid man going through the wall, right? No fear. And honestly, this is not anything I really saw in 2009. The images, the sort of clips, TikToks, or whatever coming out of Iran, been amazing. Burning police cars, setting things, you know, uh, security agents, vehicles on fire. This is just, I don't even know what to make of this sort of violence, counter violence, the state violence. And predictably, and this is something that we talk a lot about in poli sci, when you use violence against the state, the state comes back in a massive way, right? Tenfold. You can't win that battle through violence. The state violence is the violence, right? Uh, the capacity to kind of suppress protests by the state, so long as the agents are willing to pull the trigger, is uh, incomparable. So I think 
is unlikely to end. The sort of protest of violence or this manner of protest is unlikely to bring Brown to the end of the Islamic Republic until what we describe as the boys with the toys. Now, who would be the boys with the toys? Cops and military revolutionary guards, until they are convinced to not pull the trigger anymore against their own citizens. Right? So I think the awful truth is, and this is the kind of Debbie Downer part of the talk, I'll end on a more upbeat note, is that Iran is a country stuck. It's in a prolonged impasse of the worst of all worlds. It's a fierce state, not a strong state. This is, again, a kind of poli sci term. Um, it's unable and unwilling to quell the demands of the majority of its citizens, and it's met on the, on the streets by a public determined to maintain its dignity and freedom. But there's no, Iran is not a unitary state. There's no single node. There's a supreme leader, but there's no head that if you cut that head off, as in a Saddam Hussein's Iraq, right, or in Assad, Syria, if you cut that head off, the whole thing will collapse. There will be no Qaddafi moment pulling Qaddafi out of the storm pipe. No Saddam moment where they, the Americans pulled him out of the, the spider hole. You know, Iran is run by the consensus, by consensus of an entrenched, like-minded set of elites and institutions. They will continue to muddle along until the next crisis comes along. Okay, here's the real conclusion. Am I good on time? Okay, 15 minutes. Uh, 15 minutes. Oh, okay. um, so at the beginning, I asked you what? What makes these protests different? And how are they revolutionary? I also ask you, in what ways might we consider a revolution to have come to an end? But I want you to consider the pop possibility that the way we think about revolution and dramatic change in Iran is not what is actually happening on the streets of Iran, particularly amongst women, young women. Maybe our thoughts don't line up with what's happening, particularly around the veil. What if revolution looks like this? This image that's up here. This is a recent image. Or like this. Or like this. Two young women having the most traditional breakfast you could imagine. This is in the southern part of Tehran. Uh, Niro, right? In a place that's usually filled with men, but without any sort, not even no veil, but no manteau, no covering, uh, pious covering at all. What constitutes resistance? This is a question you should always ask yourself. This was one of the major benefits I had from actually going to Iran to try to do research. What does resistance actually constitute? I suspect for many Iranians who know very well that revolutions can bring about very bad and unexpected results, the aim is for what we might describe as ordinary, extraordinary, ordinary. I mentioned this phrase earlier. You get to just chill out and hang out on a subway line, on a tube line. Whether you wear the chador or not, nobody cares. You know, what my friend and scholar Nahid Siamdus describes as a longing for an ordinary life, one that brings together the threads of justice and freedom in Iranian society. An ordinariness that even for the most pious of Iranians is already there. The, the, the truth is, and this is not discussed enough, is that some of the most religious Iranians are tired of this. They're tired of going out on the streets, being accosted or being insulted, or feeling that their own religion is being destroyed or diminished by the awful politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. They love Islam. Maybe they even love Khomeini's revolution, but they're sick and tired of feeling that Islam is being used as a kind of cruel instrument to suppress populations. They want to be able to hang out with Winnie Pooh. They want to wear their chador, or they want their friend to not have to wear the chador, the full veil. It's up to them, right? One thing, when we think about extraordinary ordinariness, one thinks about the awful tragedy of Masa Amin. This young Kurdish Iranian woman, and the bottomless pain felt by her family, seeing her receiving the news of her death. She didn't ask for this. One of my students years ago, I would teach a class on revolutions. Um, he pointed out that revolutionaries don't necessarily know that they're on a revolutionary path, certainly not its victims, whether it be Masa Amini, she didn't ask for this, right? Or Bouazizi in Tunisia, the guy, the young man who set himself on fire, right? And sparked, so to speak, the, uh, the Arabs revolt, the Arab Spring, or frankly, George Floyd in Minneapolis. George Floyd didn't know that he was gonna be the leader or the spark that would lead to the Black Lives uh, Matters movement that we experience here in this country. Why should it be this way, right? George Floyd's daughter uh, is, is reported to have said, I think to, to President Biden, my daddy changed the world. My question is, wouldn't it be better for her to have her daddy around, right? Wouldn't it have been in the forefront of protests in Iran from the beginning? At least last few pictures, some of my favorite pictures ever from the revolution, 79 revolution. One wonders what it would have been like to have a world where this was not necessary. This is what I mean by ordinary, extraordinary ordinariness of having a world of just living your life. 
So there was a song last year and it won the Grammy for this new category that they have and Joe Biden came out. He has my name, so it's it's uncommon for me to hear my name. Pronounced correctly. <laughs> Sharavina, this is last name, Harjipur. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the song, for freedom. It became like a viral hit. Uh, it was a big part of the protest last fall. Um, and this, this whole song to me is about that ordinariness that I'm describing. Well, this is it's hard to watch this not get emotional i don't know if I'm, I'm the far end of things um but you see as a panoply of like just random things that are just like extinct animals or environmental yes Actually, the name of track is just uh, Baroya. Baroya. Okay, it's not Azadi. Yeah, Baroya. So that makes it even more general, right? Oh, or no, thank you. So I need to correct that. Um, so I'll end with, you know, I asked at the beginning of this uh, lecture again, are these protests revolutionary? When does a revolution begin? What makes a revolutionary? I want to end with not a political or sociological kind of cultural explanation that I've tried to provide for you today, but with a more lyrical kind of ending or description of what's happening in Iran, uh, a question of when do revolutions begin? And I think the answer for me is the melting away of fear. I'm gonna give you two examples. The first is uh, an interview I did with two young, a young couple that was going to the 3 million person march that I described at the beginning in 2009. Um, I wrote an essay about this. Uh, today on the slate side, this is a picture I took of uh, Major Nazadi, uh, Freedom Square that day. Today, under slate skies, and despite official warnings that the permit to march had been denied, against rumors that orders had been given to shoot to kill, they came. They came by the tens, if not hundreds of thousands, marching east and west along the many kilometers of Engelov Street to Ozarbi or Freedom Square. This couple that I asked, I, I said, Why are you going to this protest? Aren't you afraid? Because I was afraid, right? So I was trying to get strength from them. And we were all getting in a cab together. And they said to me, It would be just something the, the wife, in fact, said, it would be dishonorable, no matter me, to not go. A young couple explained, "We have to go." The other example I want to give you is, is from my one of my all-time favorite books about Iran, about the revolution. <coughs> uh, it's written by this Polish uh, journalist and author Kapuscinski. He's buddies with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, so he writes in a very similar, magical, realist style. In other words, when you read this book, you don't, you're not certain what actually happened and what is his imagining of the Iranian revolution. It's very lyrical, it's very poetic and beautiful. The name of the book is Shaw, Shaw. Uh, it took me forever to figure out how to pronounce his last name too, so I, I, I can sympathize with people who struggle with my struggle, uh, Kabazinski. He writes, he gives, this, he gives this description just to set this up of another square, right? I'm not sure what square it is, and the crowd is facing the Shaw's troops, okay? And he, he writes, now the most important, the moment that will determine the fate of the country, the Shaw and the revolution is the moment when one policeman walks from his post toward one man on the edge of the crowd and orders the man to go. Until now, whenever these two men approached each other, a third figure instantly intervened between them. That figure was fear. But this time, everything turns out differently. The man doesn't run. So that, that anecdote, I described as the parable of the cop, ends with the cop not knowing what to do and the man not knowing what to do because for the first time ever in his life, the man is not afraid of the cop, but he stands against them, right? And everything falls into place after that. But, you know, from the poli sci perspective, we have no idea how you get to that moment. All the books, articles, all the research that's been done makes guesses at it, but there's a kind of magical moment there, which in retrospect seems inevitable that there would be a kind of collapse of repression or repression. So, I'm not sure exactly what that means. If I, here I am, I put this lecture together, but to me, this is a fun way or a nice way of ending it, maybe on a, on a note of hope. So again, thank you for your uh, attention. I really appreciate uh, your time here, and I hope I, I'm able to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
for this one. Okay. Can you read the chat on the yeah, there are no questions. On there? So the people who are online, if there are already questions? There are no questions. No questions. No questions. Okay. The people who are online can go ahead and if they have questions, go ahead and write them in chat. And uh, are there any questions from any of you? Yes. You see kind of like you said, a, a C. I think you have to so the Zoom folks can hear this. Yeah. Oh yeah, just bellow. We spoke that we're seeing a sort of ceasefire between the protests and the government. Do you yeah. think there's anything the government can do to compromise to quell the dissent of yeah. young people? Well, I mean, there's a big thing they can do, and this has been the pattern, right? Um, whenever there have been protests, there have been concessions made either in the economic realm or in the political realm, specifically around allowing certain candidates to run for office. Given all that's happened, it's not going to be water under the bridge, to use a cliche, right? People are going to remember the deaths. I mean, this is this repression is nothing like 2009 and the 2019 protest, that the Auburn protest. So I think that, to use another cliche, I think the horse is out of the barn there. It'd be very hard to go back uh, at this point. But again, to be very blunt with you, that's been the pattern. It's a kind of cycle of violence and then a kind of pause. And then on the next vote or the next set of elections, a kind of conciliatory stance, right? Um, so much of this is centered around women's garb and clothing. And, and certainly from our perspective outside of Iran, that's what we tend to fixate on. As I said, there's a kind of unofficial truce or concession being made now. It's astonishing to me, and it speaks to the sense that many in the leadership feel that it is that the, the notion of how women ought to look in public is tied to the, the qualities or the nature of the regime that they can't let this go. I mean, to me, it's a very simple solution. Just drop it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Cairo, for example, to Egypt, but you go there and you see women dressed in a much more pious fashion than I ever saw in Tehran. Right? There's a constant pushing against the veil, whether it's done for political reasons or because women just want to feel that way and dress a certain way. is unimportant to me. It's, it's a kind of uh, corrosion of what the state wants or has wanted for decades now. So why not drop it and let pious women, that's why I kept showing those images of women without the hijab or chador next to women and their friends, obviously, you can tell from the images, they're buddies. I saw that, these are images I took off the web, but I saw that constantly in Tehran, constantly. So that's a very easy concession to make. It's not gonna be everything, um, but you know, loss of legitimacy can only go so far in terms of transforming a system. You need to have an alternative. Mm -hmm. and a leadership and a program. And I think Iran has that already in the sense that it has a kind of constitutional legacy. But what can this Nizam do to, to concede or placate populations? I'm skeptical that they will or can. And that's why I said I think Iran is at in a kind of worst of all worlds mm -hmm. impasse. That's my kind of, again, kind of negative take on the circumstances here. I was skeptical that this would be an overthrow of the regime. There's just too much violence on one end to allow that to happen. Um, and I couldn't see a viable kind of leadership. And certainly the diaspora part of it is just awful. There's not gonna be a solution from overseas, so. Thank you. No good answer for you, sorry. Yeah. You said there was Yeah, questions. so there, there is one question. Um, uh, Warren is wondering kind of about like the validity and choice of elections in the past and I guess yeah. kind of in the future. Um, yeah. So they're asking, um, are there actually like real choices to elect people that will bring meaningful change instead of perhaps even if it's in the remix version? That yeah, that's a great question, Warren, uh, unseen Warren here. Um, there was, I mean, in the past, again, it wasn't so much, I have to emphasize this, right? I'm not doing a kind of pie in the sky or Pollyannish take here. The, the choice of candidates was someone who is the best of the worst, right, to prevent the hardline elements, the ranches, kind of old school thinking from coming into power or back into power. And from there, maybe you get a foothold to some sort of improvement. And life is better in Iran, certainly in the capital, when a more moderate president, for example, or government is in charge. I'm looking at you, Cole, because I can't look at it, Warren. Um, I'll, be, I'll be Warren. You'll be Warren. Yeah, you'll play that one. Um, from here on in the remix version, will there be candidates? Again, I don't. 
I'm very skeptical. My perspective on how revolutions occur, or how uh, social movements occur, you're always bringing elements of domination or the past system into whatever you're going to bring into the future. You have unexpected results from that. So you might have a kind of transform transformative change, whether it's through elections or through mass protests in the streets. But um, at this point, at this juncture, it's unclear to me whether that's even a possibility anymore, given, I mean, it's not just that they pulled off to use the old poli sci cliche about off ramps, they just completely demolished it over the last two years, two or three years. The Guardian Council, the more conservative, and I don't understand why. I mean, it, was, it was not ultimately to their benefit from, again, from an outside perspective to allow this sort of disruption to occur in Iran. There was a kind of gradual and iterative change occurring, maybe not satisfying, maybe ultimately leading to not much, but it's better, I think, than the circumstances we have now, which is death and destruction and an unclear path into the future. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that in the present moment that there's a, a real potential for change in the way I describe. And that's why I emphasized I did that long bit on the elections. I really just want to drive home what's lost. And I think we can learn from that. Because certainly in the future, when things do change, that can come back. Iranians who participate in the vote, who showed up for a vote that they didn't believe in, have learned something. Right? Bless you. And there's no, no problem. There's, there's no reason to think that they'll forget that lesson. And honestly, and this is me speaking as an American now, I find Iranian engagement with democracy be very mature because of the BS they have to go through, through the travails and the obstacles they have to go through to I'm just talking about ordinary Iranians, right? Maybe moderate or middle road Iranians. So they're very appreciative and understanding of what it means to actually participate in, a, in an election that is contested um, or ought to be contested in a way that maybe we take for granted in the US. That's the blessing of being in an advanced democracy, I suppose. Yeah, so I think you, oh, go ahead. Your microphone, yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I just want to uh, I, I'm, I'm basing this question solely on the experience that we had with Egypt. In uh, Egypt, yeah. what happened was, I mean, the same cops and army that, I mean, stopped triggering and, I mean, stopped uh, using the bullets. Yes. Then after two years, they came back and yeah. everything went back. I mean, then that basically even worse. Maybe even worse, yeah. Maybe even worse. So yeah. that, is, that is also, and I want to know what's your take on it, because I think yeah. for, the, for sure, I mean, cops and IRDC may basically stop supporting the, I don't I don't like the word overlords, but yeah. The yes. Barracks, yeah. Uh, yet they may become themselves, as many would argue that. So yeah, like to we had a book, I have it here with me, called Power and Change in Iran. And that was the hot topic after 2009. Is Iran going in that deep state military? You know, we don't really have this history in the modern Iranian era, right? Of security state forces or military rule, if I'm correct. There's always been an overlord, whether it's the Shah or the Rafa. And the argument that, you know, the people we wrote this book with were smarter than I am in this regard, especially that the relationship between the, the clerics and the IRGC is not two separate groups, but a very interlocked and intertwined group, right? Through marriage, through war experience, revolutionary experience, and through bureaucratic experience, they all kind of come up together, you know? Um, so whether one group, whether there would ever be a coup in Iran or kind of military takeover, I think a lot of the scholars to this day remain skeptical. So maybe that's now, again, a hot topic that Iran is headed down that path. I'm in the skeptical account too. Um, and, and particularly if we take into account that within the clerics and certainly within the Revolutionary Guard, there is great difference of opinion and factionalism affects them as much as. So, um, but who knows, right? Maybe more hardline elements will eliminate, literally eliminate the rivals within the IRGC and keep the, the cleric, the Rouhani kind of as a, a figurehead or symbolic you know, to keep the wrath back, I guess, but really who's in charge? The, 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 the general of the IRGC, that sort of, whoever that figure might be. Um, but I don't see any indication that that's the, I mean, what you describe is very important though, which is that, yes, we get the boys with the toys to stop shooting. And this happened in, in many of the post-Soviet countries too, as well as Latin America, but they stay around. 
You know, I was in Chile in 1999. Augusto Pinochet goes to London to get his back treated and he gets arrested, right? He was a senator at that point. And it was a lot of talk like, oh my God, are the military going like, to, what's going to happen, et cetera. Uh, this is in Chile, a country that had come out of democracy <coughs> over 10 years at that point. So the kind of post military or post violent period is always a kind of tenuous one, I think, in a lot of the countries. Um, and it's a, it's a process over time of kind of placating or reassuring security elements that they get to keep their privileges, that they won't be taken to court, et cetera, that the past has to be left in the past. And then over time, there's a kind of development or robustness of democracy. Um, but Iran's not even at that point yet, is it? I mean, I don't know how you feel, but I what strikes me about the current period, if we go from 2019 to now, so now it's become four years almost, is how quickly the state turned to violence. I mean, and you grew up in Iran, so you saw this firsthand. I've never seen this before, where the regime instantly, right? In the Green Movement, it took like several weeks for the true violence to begin in 2009. It didn't happen. I mean, then the medic is shot, et cetera, but like the real like repression kicked in. But in, in Alban, it was just immediate, and definitely this time it was immediate. So but that... Again, from a poli sci perspective, that's very troubling to me because violence and violence doesn't lead to democratic outcomes. I don't think ultimately. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, when you were comparing the difficulty of uh, I mean, with the regime, uh, you compared Iran with Saddam Hussein or Qatar, and you said that the collapse. Yeah, yeah it's, there's not only one top leader, and then yeah. you get rid of it. It's, it's yeah. I wonder how you compare Iran today with Iran 1970s under, under Shah. Because at that time, popular revolution yeah. got a lot was, uh, yeah. successful. So yeah. I just want you to compare. I think, to... I, again, I might be completely wrong here, but it strikes me as an apple and an orange comparison. I mean, the Pahlavi state is not the Islamic Republic state maybe under Khomeini for some time, but even Khomeini couldn't control the factional. He called them a nest of scorpions, right? Or he had some very famous phrase very early on. And, you know, he ends his life really thinking about this. How do we institutionalize my charismatic authority in the constitution? So, Mehdi uh, Boujadi is a very important scholar who's written a lot about this. I think he describes uh, the, the office, now the office of the Supreme Leader is not being very much like the kind of unitary or singular leader that the Shah represented to Iranians. And, and of course, Iran, Iran, the Iranian public had a very different sociological and political history at the time. They had not yet experienced what it's like to live in a state where you have elections every year. Okay, these elections are bogus perhaps, but nonetheless, there's a kind of democratic practice and engagement with politics that is very different from my perspective than what happened in the pre-79 period. Yes, there's a Senate and there's a Majlis, but is it the same as what happens after? Probably not. And so I think, yeah, the the the, the kind of self-awareness of the Nizam to create a, a system that, I mean, they always say this, ordinary run is, as you know, we'll say this, like, like they're everywhere. And so you cut, you get rid of one guy, that whole system remains. In terms of I don't think the Pahlavi state was like that, but. In terms of popular support, you said that 30% of Iranians that's are my, supportive of the regime anyway. That's my guess, yeah, just based yeah, on the voting numbers. Popular support yeah. for the Shah in 1970, though it was that That's a great question. That's a great question, yeah. I mean, the, Charles Kurtzman has written about, we talked about this earlier, for, somehow he knows the French Revolution in 1789, 1% of the population going into the streets was enough to overthrow Louis XVI. In Iran, you had 10%. Okay, you don't need a large, you don't need, revolutions aren't determined by majorities. They're determined by the will of the public, right? The presence of the public and the, the, the decision by those who can suppress the public and not do, you know, the army to stand down in the case of Iran, perhaps to their own regret, right? Because many of those same generals ended up on the roof, as you know, and were executed very shortly after. So, but that's a, that's a wonderful question. One, honestly, I've never considered, what was the level of support for the Shah and 79. I guess I would even say maybe even higher than 30 percent. If, if I measure all the Iranians I know in Los Angeles, it seems like 100 percent sometimes. <laughs> I'm not in that group necessarily, but um, just to reveal a little bit of my Iranian politics. Um, but ultimately it didn't matter, did it? So maybe I'm wrong. I, this is what I take your question as. 
maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the 30% aren't enough to stop. But that 30% might be enough to create violence and resistance. Maybe they can be convinced to back down and accept whatever new system. But I'm worried that that's not going to be easy. Thank you. I don't know. That's a beautiful question because now I have something to think about on the flight home. <laughs> Thank you. So my question is this. As you know, these uh, set of protests are indicted by a so-called charismatic leader. You know? The current protests? The, uh, yeah, these current pro Who, protests you know, are not guided by a Or not guided. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay yeah, that's why I was confused. By so-called, you know, charismatic leader. Yes, sir, okay. yeah, I agree. So, uh, people in Iran, or I should say the Iranian people, are asking, you know, what will be the conclusion of these protests? Mm. You know, the other day, yeah. I was listening to a program, you know, the host, okay, he was like, uh, he, he was explaining about a, a BBC segment, you know, and the segment was all about an interview with. The Iran Abraham Iran, mm -hmm. okay, and it was like, uh, and he mentioned that in that segment or in that short interview, he mentioned that these, you know, set of protests, you know, will not uh, won't lead to a desired conclusion, you know, as the people want, or I should say, you know, it won't reach the conclusion the people are desiring, which okay? is what did he? mean by that the, so people uh, what is that conclusion that he was people describing? are trying to overthrow mm. okay the Islamic Republic yeah. regime okay yeah. so he meant you know that this will not happen because you know the because you know in his opinion you yeah. know the uh, 1979 revolution had a charismatic leader you oh, know yeah now it's a lot more than many. one yeah okay but these set of protests you know, are guided by a charismatic leader just like him, you know, so yeah. it won't reach a conclusion, you know, in his opinion. Yeah. So I want to know your take, you know, on the conclusion of these set of protests. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was trying to say. Well, you know, when I'm saying, on the slide, uh, well, it doesn't matter what the slide was, but uh, almost immediately there was a question, okay, I personally saw Musabi in the crowd in Tupuana, you know, in 2009. This was a guy who was not charismatic, as you know, right? I mean, Hussein Musabi, he became charismatic, but he was no, he was just this guy that wanted this, this engineer. I mean, he was a prime minister, but he never had the kind of qualities of leadership that he came to have. He grew into that role, I think, during the Green Movement. And as you know, many Iranians don't accept him because of the repressions that occurred in the 80s under his government, whatever. But that, regardless of what happened in the 80s, what he did in 2009 was clearly, he became the charismatic figure, he became a leader, but not just him, right? There were others as well, as you know, uh, who participated and led that movement. They're all under house arrest presently uh, in Iran. And they also had a program. It's not just about the leadership. See, I think the desire to have a savior, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I think many people still assume there would be another Khomeini figure, you know, a kind of... George Washington, but even Washington didn't play this role, kind of, you know, powerful person on a horseback, as we used to say about Reza Shah, would show up and save the day. Napoleon on horseback or whatever underestimates the maturity, if I can use that language, of the Iranian public as a political body, right? I think people know that you need leadership, but they don't necessarily need to follow blindly behind someone or someone who, you know, controls them or whatever through his charm that magic that Max Weber describes of charismatic authority. Um, so certainly that doesn't exist in Iran. And for me, even more importantly, frankly, is the lack of a kind of agenda or program or an approach, which the Green Movement, for all of its faults, certainly went to great lengths to produce, right? A kind of manifesto. What do we want from the Nizam? What do we expect from the Nizam? beginning with restoring our vote, et cetera, and then what would happen in the next elections. And to a certain extent, I think the Nizam responded to those demands in the 2013 elections, I think. I mean, obviously they've reneged on a lot of it. Um, so the lack of a charismatic leader and the lack of a kind of program, I think, bodes very badly 
for where this, but that doesn't mean this world didn't matter. You know, these, these lies were not lost in vain, if you ask me. I mean, there's clearly a signal has been sent, a very painful and powerful signal to the Nizam that this is what's going to happen from now on until you get it together, get your act together. So, Dr. Clark. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, there's a, there's a question on Zoom from Paul. Uh, he asks, uh, to what extent do you think that the most recent protests in Iran are an instance of the hidden transcript exploding into the public? Oh, nice. The concept of James Scott. Yes, James Scott's hidden transcript. Does everybody know the hidden transcript? Yeah. So James Scott, and you can see right now, I'm already skeptical a little bit of the hidden transcript, but it's this idea that we have onstage banter, what you say in front of your professor. Oh, how are you doing? Great day. I love your class. And then when you step outside in the hallway and the professor's not around, this class is horrible. I hate that, but, you know. So his, his <laughs> James Scott describes how the peasant bows before the master, but he farts, right? So you should, superficially, you look like, that's the visible transcript. You're, play, you're, now, you're playing your role in the hierarchy, but you're resisting. And so the hidden transcript explodes onto the main stage when there's an opportunity. And it's revealed much to the shock and dismay of Louis the 16th, right, in his court or whatever, that, oh my God, they hated me all this time as his head is getting chopped off, I guess. Um, so is this a descriptive, I mean, but everything, I appreciate the question. I think in Iran, there, there is the hidden transcript, it's being expressed in the visible transcript, right? I think, um, yeah, I don't know if it applies to the Iranian case. I mean, definitely, <laughs> there is, in this regard, I will agree with him. Uh, Timur Kuran who's a professor, a Turkish professor, but he writes about a preference falsification. And I think you're seeing a lot of that in Iran where uh, you saw this certainly in the Soviet Union or in the Russia case where people had a very strong feeling against a system, but because there was no alternative or no opportunity, they didn't reveal what their preferences were. Or there's a hidden preference, maybe a better way of putting it. I can't remember how he phrased it. But then when the moment comes, it, be it becomes revealed that this is actually what we want. These problems have been going on so often in Iran. I, I think there's no question that Nizam knows. You know, uh, several years ago, maybe I'll answer my long-winded or end my long-winded answer with this. Khamenei, I think in the 2016, maybe 2013 elections, he he announced he almost begged the public to vote, even if you don't believe in this system. That's I think that's exactly how he said it, because Iran needs this legitimacy against its foreign enemies. Can you imagine this Islamic leader saying to the public, "I get it, you guys hate me." But I still need you to show up and vote. What year was that? Yes. It was repeated for the last Where's the where's the hidden transcript there? You know, so it becomes visible the, when the leader knows what you're saying about him behind his back. When you say death and dictator, pretty publicly, I think that, you know. But that's a that's a very good way of looking at Iran, I think, because I think it's an important perspective that James Scott brings. And I don't I'm not sure if it applies exactly to the Iranian case, but it's definitely something to consider for what comes next. Maybe there is a hidden transcript that will fall into place. Yeah. So the correct you know, in 2013, I guess, you know, he was like, if you guys don't like him, you know, the show up and we'll vote just for Iran. Just for, for Iran. Iran. Not just yeah, exactly. Uh, not for the Islamic Republic, you know, just for Iran. Iran. Yeah. Which is guaranteed, but in his mind, the Islamic Republic protects Iran, right? Yeah. So he was playing a game there a little bit, I think. But you're right, he, he did emphasize the Iran part. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Iran's faced a lot of pressure from the international community, both for both governmental and, I guess I call it societal, yeah. um, understanding Iran's complex history with outside powers exerting influence or whatever you want to call it. Do you think the international community, be it governments or societal, is having any effect on the <coughs> status quo in Iran, um, women in, across the globe? In, in terms of enabling a democracy movement or mm -hmm. women's rights, I'm, I'm very much in a group that is skeptical that sanctions or outside, I mean, there's a kind of security approach to Iran, mm -hmm. a containment approach, which hopefully will remain that, not the you saw you described how you were there firsthand when so the money was not there in Iraq, no. but <laughs> you know um, in the military when uh, so the money was killed and, uh, and violence did occur between the Americans and the Iraqis, as you know, right? Missiles were sent to the base. Um, do sanctions enable democracy in Iran? 
does the elimination under the Trump administration of the, except from the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, does that help democracy Iran? Uh, you know, or is that just hurting Iran citizens? I think it does hurt. Yeah. I think that's clear. I mean, Cuba remains Cuba, right? Exactly. I mean, that, let's start with that example. So Saddam Hussein's Iraq was under sanctions for decades. Decades, but over a decade at least. And um, you know, there are all sorts of figures about the number of children who were killed as a result of American sanctions, et cetera. Iran's inflation rate and poverty rate is it's almost exponential at this point. And these are tied directly to things were getting so good. You know, when the JCPOA was passed and like Boeing was about to go to Iran. And you know, I think there's a mindset that, oh, this enables violence, this enables dictatorship. But to me, what it actually enables is the Iranian leader or politician who says, look at these American bastards. You can never trust them. Khamenei has said this directly. All they understand is a punch in the face. You can never believe in what they say. And we have to stand strong against these, these um, the great Satan, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And it, it, it sucks the oxygen out of the room, so to speak, of those who would say, look, conciliation, diplomacy are also in Iranian interests. Right, you don't go to war. You go to the negotiating table, and you don't give up your country when you do that, either as an American or as an Iranian. So, um, you know, the terrain and the possibility for a democracy movement in Iran has been, because of the security situation that Iran is now facing through sanctions and through military containment, has improved the prospects for those who are more hardline, and it certainly uh, eliminated the capacity of those who are more in the kind of peaceful camp, I guess, or mm -hmm. reform camp to make their case. Because the public sees like, what did you guys bring for us? Our economy's a wreck. Our situation in the world is wreck. And these bastards, we can't get rid of them unless we use violence, which we're not ready to do because we don't know what's going to replace mm -hmm. them. So I, I think America's done a great disservice to Iran by its actions. Certainly the exit from the JCPOA was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. But nuclear arms experts say that. I just from that perspective alone, people who work on this stuff, Say so this was a great deal. They've never seen anything like it before. Supposedly, the Iranians are allowing some of it to come back, like the monitoring, the cameras are being turned back on. Um, but is this just a game that the Iranians are playing so that they can eventually get to that threshold where they might go nuclear? I mean, that remains to be seen, I think. But um, it's not going to go back to what it was before. And that's a op huge opportunity loss, huge opportunity. Loss. Outside of the JCPOA and nuclear deals, do you think that? the regime just sees the denouncements of treatment during protests as finger wagging from people hypocrites who, yeah yeah of course that's the, that's what they say i mean they're full of it when they mm -hmm. say that there's no comparison to a cop in buffalo i think it was buffalo where they hit the old guy during the black lives Matter, white guy right knock him to the ground there was no i mean the cops who did what they did to george floyd the last one got state charges of manslaughter um you know recently passed on him but that, that's nothing compared to taking young teenagers and you know, accosting them sexually in prisons or right. killing them in the streets, killing young people. I mean, these pictures of the young folks, the mural I showed of the nine figures, the stencil, to me, they're still alive because I see their clips constantly, but they're all dead. I mean, we don't have that in the US, the killing of children, not at the level you see in Iran. So I want to be clear, like, it sounds like I'm making a more kind of heterodox approach to like what the state does in Iran, but in reality, um, the finger pointing or that the Americans are like this is just a bunch of hypocrisy from the part of Tehran, ultimately. Um, and it's certainly hypocrisy from the perspective of the piousness, the self-professed piousness and virtue that they present themselves as being like, we're truly Islamic, et cetera. Islam does not allow for this. Again, folks who are much more religious than me feel this much greater than I do because it's their religion or their practice that's being assaulted by these uh, state but, you know, this is what happens when you mix politics with religion. Right? It's two different realms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, secularism doesn't mean you're anti-religious. It means you're preserving religion. So, yeah, I ended with a rant. <laughs> Sorry to put you short. No, right. yeah, that's okay. It's good. Can't escape the ranting when it comes to Iran. Um, we're out of time, I think. Is it still going? Is it? Yeah, we're past. One time. of the things I want to mention the little girl yeah. with the clash of calm. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you see the quotes? I. By Tolo Tolorani. Oh, uh, was it Tolorani? Yeah. Okay, let me get it. Which we, uh, which is usually understood to be a moderate. Yes. Uh, and uh, he was also a thing toward the left, but he, he died in the yeah. uh, fall of uh, 1979, even before the hostage crisis. Back here? The other thing that I wanted to mention also is 
that the demographics in Iran are changing very quickly. Yeah. Well, I'm going to use it. Oh, no. Oh, he had it in his Yeah. One of the other things that the demographic has changed very quickly, the, the growth rate has dropped down to 1% yes. and the medium age is rising very quickly. So that is going to bring changes as well. Yeah. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.